Hey guys, Yusuf Justin Holcroft here again, and thank you once again to Marshall Music for inviting me here to come out and talk to you about things that I've sort of done and mm, experienced, and relevant to South Africa, relevant to ev what we do every day. Well, not at the moment, but what we should be doing every day, which is standing in front of people and performing in front of them and showing off how brilliant we are because we put so much time into getting to that point. So I'm going to ask you, there's not going to be much music in this, but it's going to be a bit of more of a philosophical debate today. Um, and I'm going to ask you the question, what is our job? Now, I've got a few ideas and I know that all of you are now jumping into whatever you're watching this on and saying, I'm a musician, I'm a musician, I'm a professional musician. Really proud of it. Now, here's the problem. A lot of you watching this also call yourselves jazz musicians, even better. Jazz musicians are cool and we love jazz musicians. Unfortunately, we love jazz musicians because we are also jazz musicians. Most people don't love jazz musicians and this is our biggest problem. And it goes beyond that. It's not that most people don't just love jazz musicians. Most people don't actually like jazz. Now I'm gonna challenge you to think back to gigs you've done in restaurants, pubs, bars, clubs, where, and even some of the big corporate gigs where you've got a room full of people in front of you and ask yourself, how many of those people in that audience do you really seriously think like jazz? And the answer is probably going to be about what, 5%, 10% if you're lucky. Here's the point. Most people don't like jazz. That's unfortunate fact number one. Unfortunate fact number two is most people don't like jazz because they don't understand jazz. Unfortunate fact number three, most people go to live gigs expecting not to be disturbed. Which means that we're <laughs> in a bit of a difficult situation when we set up on stage in a pub, a restaurant, or in a hotel lobby, or in a function room, or on a big stage with people in front of us, most of whom are sitting there expecting, hopefully, to just sit, enjoy a meal, have a nice chat, and enjoy the company that they've chosen to keep on that particular evening, afternoon, or even morning. So. What they don't want is intrusions. And they particularly don't want intrusions from people playing music they don't understand or like. Now ask yourself, have you ever played in a restaurant? And the famous one is a certain casino venue up in Four Ways, which I'm not going to mention by name, uh, where even as you're setting up your band, one of the restaurant managers will come over to you and say, could you play quieter, please? So you're going to get this. You're going to get asked to play quieter uh, and you're going to get asked to play quieter to such an extent that you actually have to turn everything off and dismantle the drums. The next thing that's going to happen to you, because our audience wants to have a quiet evening or a quiet afternoon or a quiet breakfast and have a chat with their mates, the next thing that's going to happen is they will get grudgingly to the point where they will actually listen to you, they will then recognize, hey, this is jazz. What could I ask for? You will then get asked to play take five. Now, my standard response when I get asked to play take five is, I'm sorry, we can't play take five because nobody in the band can count that far. Always works and always gets you out of a tight situation, unless you particularly enjoy take, take, uh, playing take five, which not many people do, let's face it. The next thing that's going to happen is they're going to come up with, with requests for you to play anything other than jazz. So here are your favorites if you're a saxophone player. Careless Whisper, Baker Street. Um, yeah, the list goes on and they're all horrible and they're all nothing to do with jazz. So this is the reality, guys. We play lots and lots of jazz gigs and we call ourselves jazz musicians, but actually what we end up playing most of the time is either really, really quiet, i.e. to ourselves, or we end up playing stuff that isn't really jazz because that's what the audience is demanding. Now, here's the point. We're in a bit of a difficult situation because we call ourselves professional musicians. 
professional jazz musicians even, but actually what is our job? Our job is unfortunately not just to play what we want to play and what we've been trained to play. That's not the job. Now, next point. Have any of you ever committed the capital offence of asking for requests? If you've never done it, brilliant, fantastic. My advice to you, never ask for requests. We get requests all the time in my quintet, the use of Justin Holcroft quintet. Um, and in spite of that, we carry on playing. Bottom line is, anybody in your audience will say this to you, they like what they know. If you start playing stuff they don't know, then they're likely not to like it. Here's the next point. They particularly, if they don't know what you're playing, they are going to be particularly averse to hearing lots of virtuosity. They're going to be averse to hearing obscure melodies and they're going to be aver averse to hearing lots of polyrhythms, which basically takes all of the tools out of our bag, because as jazz musicians, we are good at virtuosity, we are good at obscure melodies, and we are good at polyrhythms. Um, that's not what they want to hear. And unfortunately, the bottom line is, they're paying us to play there. And if we're not entertaining them, they're not going to pay us ever again, and they might even refuse to pay us this time. So. Good tip, avoid giant steps in 7-4 at 320 BPM going up a semitone every chorus. It's probably not going to go down particularly well with the majority of your audience. Here's the basic philosophy. And I know it sounds harsh, but in later videos, we're going to start talking about how can we take this philosophy and make something out of it and do something with it while maintaining our own integrity. Basic philosophy is people pay money to come to gigs to be entertained. They come to have a good time. Our job as jazz musicians, as musicians, as professionals is to send them away happier than when they walked in. And that's it. That's all that we've got to do. Then, and only then, have we actually earned our money. And I know it's harsh, and I know it makes life difficult for us, and it means we can't play necessarily what we want to play. But in the next few videos, I'm going to be talking about what can we do about this to alleviate the problem and to make it possible for us to play what we want to play in a way we want to play it and still get the audience on our side. And I've been there and I've succeeded in doing it. And it, once it works, you just realise ah, this is the way to do it. How do we do it? The basics are, number one, let's think about repertoire. The obscure stuff, try and avoid it. You can still play difficult stuff, but the really obscure stuff, probably try to avoid when you're thinking about your repertoire. And for goodness sake, don't go into a gig, a jazz gig, not knowing what you're gonna play and just make it up on the spot and call out numbers on the spot. It doesn't work. Have an idea in your head before you go in. Number two. Tempi, the speed at which we play. Now, there's been lots and lots and lots of research on this, how tempo is related to the typical speed of a human heartbeat. So slightly above the typical speed of a human heartbeat is going to excite people, slightly below is going to relax people, bang on is going to make people feel just very, very in the pocket. Um, you can play around with that. Anything too fast, it's just going to turn people off because it's going to, to their untrained ears, sound like cacophony. Um, next thing, volume. You don't have to play fortissimo all the time. And actually, think about when you're at school. What did the teacher, if he was a good teacher or she was a good teacher, what did they do to get your attention? Did they shout at you? Not the good ones. The good ones actually didn't shout at all. What they did was go really quiet. And that was the point at which everybody in the room shut up so that they could hear the teacher. So we don't need 
to be massively loud. We don't need to be playing all the way up at 40 Simo all the time. We can actually take it down and you might stand a better chance of people listening to you because if you're playing well, melodically and in kind of tempo that's going to excite people and playing stuff that's accessible, then you can afford to pull your volume down and be a bit more subtle about what you're playing. And here's one that always works. If an audience bothers to look at you and notices that you're actually connecting with each other on stage, that there's eye contact, you're smiling at each other, that you're actually listening to each other and working together on stage, then there's a chance that something called catharsis will kick in, which is where the people in the audience start feeling the emotions you are feeling because they identify with those emotions. And you can use this. So if you've got a band that is really, really quite obviously having the time of their lives on stage just by making music, there's a good chance that your audience is gonna pick up on this and become excited just as you are excited by the music on stage. So your rapport between band members on stage really, really, really can go a long way. And look, it's showmanship. It's showmanship because we are there as entertainers and our audience wants to be entertained. So, golden rule, guys. And I know there's been no music in this whatsoever, but we're gonna get on to how to play around with the various tools in our bag to get an audience to be entertained. Uh, in future videos, we're going to come back to that. Golden rule is, we are, yes, professional musicians, yes, professional jazz musicians, but as far as our audience is concerned, we are entertainers. Just because we can play Tones for Jones Bones or Bolivia or Giant Steps doesn't mean we have to. And if we think about this, this makes a huge difference in the way we put our sets together, the way we put our music together. And let's just remember, let's rather use our technique to make our audiences happy. Bit of a more difficult job, but much more rewarding. And it means we'll get repeat bookings. Guys, I'll see you in the next video and we'll talk about how to take some of the tools that are already in our bag and use them to make an audience happy. Thanks very much.